Hello and welcome to the next lecture part on the basic mathematical definitions for classification. We were kind of extending our mathematical machine learning notation and language that we've introduced for regression now to deal with this uh, extra case of um, the classification scenario. So as we already said in classification we aim at predicting a discrete um, class label output. So um, formally we will define our output space of admissible labels curly y now as a finite set of labels which we could denote with c1, c2 up to cg where g is obviously the finite number of admissible class labels and each object from our training data is assumed to um, be is assumed to have is assumed to come from exactly one of these g classes and during prediction we also have to assign exactly one of these g classes to um, each observation x um, and to make things just a little bit more convenient during notation and algorithmic construction we will assume in this course that uh, these g class labels are actually encoded as i integer numbers so in the binary case we will assume that um, they come either from the set 0 1 or from the class uh, from the uh, from the label set minus 1 plus 1 so this plus one guy here we will usually call the positive class and this zero or minus one guy here we will call the negative class. And which of these, um, sometimes um, either this or this notation here is more convenient depending on how we want to mathematically define our um, specific uh, classification algorithm. So for probabilistic classifiers, sometimes this encoding here makes formulas a little bit shorter and convenient and sometimes for um, loss-based or geometric-based algorithms, uh, this guy or this notation here is a bit, is a bit easier. But um, generally speaking, both encodings um, can be used and um, yeah, can be um, yeah, formulas can be specified uh, for both cases um, in an equivalent manner, uh, usually one of them gives rise to shorter notation than the other. And for the multi-class case, we just assume that classes are encoded with uh, one, three, one, two, three, four, five up to G. Okay, um, we have already defined um, the mathematical structure of models for the regression case. So um, a machine learning model that we want to learn has the mathematical uh, structure of being a function of going from our feature space curly x here to a uh, g-dimensional output vector. And regression, we said this g um, is usually supposed to be 1 now for normal regression if it's not, um, not multi-output regression. And we'll use the same type of formal definition for classification models where this g here is just the uh, number of uh, class labels in our classification task. So um, this seems to be a little bit confusing and unintuitive. So what are actually these real values here? And why are we not simply saying that our function f should map to this space or set curly y of discrete class labels? I mean, this is at the end what we want to predict, right? Which category does x come from? So first of all, what do these um, numerical scores here encode? What do they mean? So we will interpret these as scores or probabilities for each of the G classes. So if we put a certain object X into F, um, the first score is going to be our confidence or our probability that the object is from the first class, second score for the second class, third score for the third class, and so on. Yeah. Um, now, second question, why are we actually doing that? Um, first of all, from an application perspective, scores and probabilities seem to be um, a bit more convenient and useful, right? So if I know the posterior probability 
of an object X uh, coming from a certain class. This is more um, valuable information than just knowing that um, yeah, I'm going to sort this into a certain class. So assume, for example, you have a, I don't know, a semi-automatic uh, system of assigning probabilities to persons having a certain disease, then it's much more valuable that you are assigning um, this person into the um, has the disease class with 55% probability, uh, which is a rather uncertain type of prediction that we might even want to reject in such a system because it is so uncertain than just saying, hey, um, it's class, uh, yeah, the, the person is sick um, and I have no further information on the confidence, on the probability, on the uncertainty um, of, of, this, um, of this automatic prediction. The second reason is more a technical one um, why these uh, continuous scores here are usually preferred in the mathematical definition. Um, and this um, comes from an optimization perspective. So later on, we will see that we, uh, as we have seen in regression, that we want to put loss functions on the predictions here, um, that we want to write down the um, empirical risk and optimize our parameters of our classification model with respect to this empirical risk. And from an optimization perspective, it's much, much, much easier to deal with uh, stuff that's based on continuous values than um, dealing with um, discrete categorical predictions. Um, and as we will also later see that scores can easily be transformed into class labels, but uh, we can't go the other way around, uh, again, because discrete class labels contain much less information than numerical confidence scores. Okay. Now let's formally um, really introduce what we mean with these scoring functions um, and um, with these scoring functions f. So before I had said it's one function f that goes from our feature space x curly x um, to r to the g. So instead of writing this down as one object here, we could also, of course, obviously talk about the uh, g individual component functions that take an element um, from curly x and assign for each um, for each class j a scalar numerical confidence score for that class j. Um, and it's now easy formally to define how we go from these uh, confidence scores for each individual class for a certain object x to a discrete um, particular class label. Well, uh, for each object x, we just compute all g scores and then we just pick the class with the highest maximal score, right? Um, and mathematically, we can write this down as um, this argmax operation here over all of the uh, g scores. And I can now also define a mathematical function h of x, which would be our categorical classifier. Uh, it takes an object x, a feature vector x, and it directly outputs a discrete class label. Uh, and in notation, if I really want to talk about the function that takes an x and outputs a um, discrete category, I will use this h of x and usually I will work on the score level and work with these f guys here. And for the special case of uh, binary classification where we only have two classes, um, it's pretty obvious that we don't really need two of these component functions f1 and f0, f minus one. So we can just usually directly work with a single function f of x where um, positive scores f of x indicate a confidence for the positive class plus one and negative scores indicate a preference for um, the negative class minus one. And if you really formally want to go from this general definition here, where you always have as many uh, component functions as classes, you could then formally define f of x as f1 of x minus f minus 1 of x. But as you will see later on, when we work with the specific case of um, 
binary classification will just directly assume that there's just a single F and uh, continue to work with this. And in this case also um, this class label construction here, this construction of this H of X class labeling function um, is a bit simplified. You can just take the sign of F of X, right? Because usually you would say that um, if that F if f of x predicts a positive score, it's class plus one. If it predicts a negative score, it's going to be um, class minus one. And from now on, I will call the absolute value of f of x in such a case, and sometimes also in the multi-class case, I will call it the confidence. Yeah? So high, the higher the score is, the more confident I am that object x is actually from that class. Um, there is a certain um, special case for scoring classifiers, which is so important um, that I want to give it a certain name and introduce extra notation for this. And this is um, probabilistic classifiers. So for probabilistic classifiers, I'm going to assume that my um, generated and predicted score is actually a real probability. So these component functions here, again, g of them, um, map all into the interval of uh, 0 to 1. And I'm now going to assume that these G scores actually encode the posterior probabilities of an object X being from class 1 and from class 2 or from class 3 up to class G. Which also implies that if I sum up all of these probabilities for a certain class, uh, the result must be one, right? Because it's probabilities. And again, I can now transform these scores completely in the same manner as before into um, class labels by just picking the class with maximum posterior probability, right? So that makes even more intuitive sense than in the um, scoring um, case before, right? Just pick the class with the highest probability if you want to make a discrete decision. And again, for class uh, for for g equals two, so the binary classification case, we can only construct one function pi of x, where pi of x actually encodes the uh, probability of x being from class one, and then one minus pi of x would encode yeah, the probability of um, x being from um, the negative class zero. And yeah, probabilistic classifiers, as I said, are completely, um, completely a special case, a subcase of scoring classifiers. If I want to emphasize that I'm talking about the special case, I will use this pi notation. And if I want to kind of talk about both cases uh, simultaneously, I'll use this general f notation yeah, that en encompasses um, both cases. As I said before, um, we can easily go from scores on probabilities to um, to discrete classes, but we can do this in an even more flexible manner that I have explained before. So for this slide here, let's focus mainly on the binary case. So we have only two classes and we either have a probabilistic classifier or a scoring classifier. So how would we usually go from well, what, what would this argmax um, um, operation mean for our probabilistic classifier? Yeah? So picking the class with the highest posterior probability um, actually means just checking whether the posterior probability for the positive class is larger than 50%, right? Because then the posterior probability for the negative class is going to be less than 50%. Um, and for our scoring classifier, we can kind of make a similar argument that if the score for uh, the positive class is supposed to be larger than the score of our negative class, we just have to check what the sign of f of x is, right? So if this is positive, it's a positive class. If this is negative, it's a negative class. And these two um, approaches 
Now we can generalize now by just saying that we want to compare our output score um, through a threshold. Um, and if the uh, posterior score exceeds that threshold, we will assign the positive class. And if it's below that threshold, we will assign the negative class. Um, and this makes it very flexible. Um, and this introduces further flexibility for the case of, uh, for example, cost sensitive classification um, or uh, scenarios where we have classes of uh, hugely different sizes when maybe we want to assign um, the positive class uh, in a much more conservative or liberal manner. Yeah? Maybe because some automatic action is going to be performed after our classification. Uh, so maybe again assume that you are in a medical diagnosis case and um, in this scenario you might want to quite conservatively um, label a person as being healthy because if you label the person as uh, being healthy no further tests are being run uh, no further treatment um, is applied to that person and if we do this incorrectly um, that person might get sent home um, might not be subjected to further treatment and actually can get worse um, and this little schematic graphic here um, yeah, shows us how we can go from probabilities to discrete classes or we can through thresholding or how we can go from scores again through thresholding to discrete classes i explained this before here um, we also discussed that obviously we can't go back from discrete classes to scores or probabilities um, there's and this thresholding technique is usually discussed further in detail in or also already mentioned that in, in yeah the um subfield of, of cost sensitive learning or sometimes also also um, roc analysis that we will say later but there's uh, also specific algorithms um, that can uh, recalibrate and scale scores into uh, probabilities and recalibrate them uh, which is all a bit too advanced for us here in this uh, introductory part um okay i want to make a couple of more um basic definitions for classifiers um, of a geometrical nature. So first of all, I want to define um, what a decision region is for a specific class for a specific classifier. So a decision region is something very simple. It is um, just the set of all input points from our feature space where class K is assigned um, to such a point. Um, so that's a sub subset of our input space curly x. I guess it's a bit easier maybe to um, demonstrate this visually. So this would maybe be our complete two-dimensional input space. We have a certain um, classifier um, in front of us and we can now check for each input, potential candidate input point, um, which class is assigned to that input point by our classifier f. Yeah? So this point here, for example, would be assigned class m um, and we would therefore color this point purple and this point here would be assigned class r and this is why we would color, color this point um, yellow. And if we consider all points that have been you know, assigned the class m and uh, therefore have been colored uh, purple the set of all of these points would be the the would be the decision region for class m and this would be the decision region for class r and then there's a second maybe even more important um definition and this is the so-called uh, decision boundary and the decision boundary of a classifier is again a set of points from the input space and it's the set of points where the um, assigned class for that point x is not unique because there's multiple classes with maximal scores for that specific point x and in uh, the binary case we can again 
yeah, forget about these multiple component functions here, just assume we have one scoring function and we can describe this non-uniqueness by saying it's all it's all points that um, all points from our feature space that where the uh, posterior score is equal to our threshold that we use um, yeah, to discriminate between the two classes. Yeah? So in by default, this, as we said before, this threshold for a scoring classifier would be zero. Yeah? So positive scores, class plus one, class plus one, uh, negative class scores, class minus one. And this threshold would be 50% for probability classifiers. So everything above 50% class plus one, everything below 50% class zero. But we can also um, yeah, generalize this here to um, arbitrary um, non-standard thresholds. So in this um, visualization here, as you can see, um, it's all binary classification scenarios. Um, and um, you can now also see, so all of these um, decision boundaries here would be um, described through this threshold uh, approach. And we can also begin to talk about uh, the geometric structure of these decision boundaries. Yeah. So this decision boundary and potentially also this decision boundary, yeah, they kind of look like um, lines, planes, or in general hyperplanes, yeah, so linear structures that um, yeah, discriminate between our classes. This looks more like a quadratic structure, and this looks like something, yeah, it's not so easy to describe. Um, yeah, maybe, um, yeah, apparently this decision boundary is made up of um, certain um, axis parallel um, component functions. Uh, this is actually a logistic regression model, um, which is a so-called linear classifier. This is naive base. We we'll later say that this gives rise to quadratic um, decision boundaries. Um, this is a so-called support vector machine. And if we don't kernelize this, this is also um, a linear decision boundary. And that's a um, card decision tree uh, with these axis parallel cuts. Okay, before we end this lecture part, I want to introduce two fundamental approaches, um, mathematical uh, perspectives that we will later use to introduce specific classification algorithms. So there's the generative approach and the discriminant approach. Um, let me directly go to their mathematical definitions because I think that's, that's a bit easier to um, describe them in the concrete. So the generative approach for classification works like that, um, works like this here. So we want to describe the posterior probability that a that an object x or a feature vector x is of class k. That would be nice, right? If we can construct a formula for this posterior probability. And in order for us to um, to model this posterior probability, we will just write down what this posterior probability um, encodes or should approximate. So it should be the conditional probability that y is of class k given that we know all feature values x. And now to make things a little bit more convenient um, and handleable for us, we'll just use Bayes' theorem to turn this here around. So you compute this posterior probability by saying, well, through Bayes' theorem, this is the um, conditional probability of x, assuming that we are in class k um, times, so this is what we call the likelihood, times the um, prior probability of y equals k. So this is kind of a global probability for class k divided by the evidence p of x or the likelihood of um, our feature vector x. 
And um, what I will now do is I'll just introduce um, a couple of abbreviations. So this prior probability here, I will just call pi of k with a shorthand notation. And this here I will um, yeah, write down with its um, density function um, p of x given y. And we also know from Bayes' theorem that by the law of total probability, we can also now express this term, um, so the likelihood of x, um, simply yeah, by yeah, iterating over terms of this structure. Yeah? So um, this is just the sum over all g classes um, of the um, likelihood of our vector x given that we are in class j times the prior probability of being in class j. So um, in order, so if you want to compute that guy here, one approach is just to kind of compute this here, right? Is this now, have you now simplified things a lot? Well, apparently there's terms of two different structures here. So one is this uh, pi k guy. So this is the prior probability for um, class k. And we now somehow have to estimate this probably, right, from, from training data, if we want to compute this guy here. Is that easy or hard to do? Well, it's not particularly hard, right? So one way of estimating this for the, from the training data is just counting how often globally um, objects from class k the core in our training data and we just write down these uh, frequency numbers, right? That's super simple to do and we already have constructed our estimator. And the second thing we need is we need this um, conditional probability or this conditional likelihood of um, x given that we are in class k. And in this generative approach we will now make an assumption on the structural form of how this um, yeah, conditional density given that we are in class KR looks like. So one way, for example, would be to assume that this is Gaussian, that this is a multivariate normal distribution. And we will see this exactly later when we are going to talk about linear discriminant analysis, quadratic discriminant analysis, and also the naive base classifier, where we will even make a further simplifying assumption on the structure of this guy here. So this is how the generative approach works. This guy is transformed through basis theorem into this structure. This we just estimate by counting from the data. And for this year, we make a simplifying assumption, distributional assumption, so we can easily um, estimate this from our training data. And yeah, there's one little um, problem with respect to terminology. I've already said that. Um, under this generative approach uh, do fall um, the so-called linear discriminant analysis model and the quadratic discriminant analysis model. Unfortunately, they have discriminant in their name uh, for historical reasons, but are uh, generative models. So, uh, as always in machine learning, uh, terminology can be a little bit confusing. And then there's this second approach, um, which is called the discriminant approach. That's um, kind of um, easier to describe. So. In the discriminant approach, this is super comparable to what we have learned for um, regression models and um, empirical risk minimization. So usually what we will do here is we will assume a certain functional form for our model F, for all candidate models F, and we will put them into a hypothesis space. We will select a certain loss function that compares predicted outcomes f of x to observed class labels and that measures the difference and then we will just optimize over this uh, hypothesis space or over the parameterization of this hypothesis space and pick the um, optimal model f hat, f hat from this hypothesis space with minimal risk and we have seen exactly the same principle before um, in the lecture parts on regression and it works in a very, very similar manner for classification. We just have to pick different loss functions because of the discrete nature of our labels here. And examples 
for this discriminant approach to classification are logistic regression, um, which is going to be our most fundamental example. Also neural networks also support vector machines um, and many other techniques.